full attention and a warm welcome to Dr. Georgia Perl. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you all um, this afternoon. And um, hopefully, I think the weather's pretty good. It's a little hot, but it's kind of nice to, no rain at least. So that's a plus for this area right now. And um, so hope you're enjoying that time outside as well as inside. But for the, about the next hour, we're going to be talking about Noah's Ark and the flood. Science confirms the Bible. Now, just a couple of years ago now, we just celebrated our three-year anniversary. Uh, we opened Answers in Genesis' newest themed attraction, and that is the Ark Encounter. Now, how many of you have already been to the Ark already with this visit, okay? How many of you still plan on going? That better be everyone else. Okay, good. Because uh, it's only 40 minutes away, so and it's definitely worth it. So for those of you that haven't been there yet, let's take a sneak peek. recently opened our uh, kangaroo uh, walkabout, and so you can walk about um, with the kangaroos and the emus, so that's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, it, it's been an amazing three years, and with many people visiting and obviously uh, many, many more on their way. But as with any attraction that is based on the truth of God's Word, um, you've probably read or heard that we have received some criticism uh, for the Ark Encounter, and sometimes a lot, um, and, and still actually continue to do so, um, even though it's doing very, very well. Um, just in the first year alone, though, these were just some of the titles of articles that I saw. Okay, Ken Ham's Crazy Ark Park. Okay, so Ken is the CEO of Answers in Genesis, which built both the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. Uh, so we're crazy. Uh, five things Kentucky could spend $73 million on instead of a fake Noah's Ark. Now, here's the thing. Kentucky didn't spend a dime right? It is a privately funded venture. And Bill and I, the so-called science guy, visited a Noah's Ark he doesn't believe should exist and many more. And like I say, that's just a small sample of the many articles that have been written decrying the Ark. Because to many people that are not Christians, okay, to many unbelievers, spending a hundred million dollars to build an Ark doesn't make any sense because they believe that the Bible is just a bunch of myth, it's a bunch of stories, it isn't true. So why would you do that? Right? And so I understand why they think that way, knowing their worldview, knowing what they think. But what's sad to me um, is it's not just unbelievers, it's not just people that aren't Christians that think that Genesis is a myth and that maybe the Bible really isn't true in all that it talks about. Sadly, some Christians are buying into these ideas as well. And a couple of years ago, we published a book called Ready to Return. And this was a study that we actually did of millennials, so the 20-somethings becoming the 30-somethings here. Um, and these are individuals who have attended church pretty much all of their lives. They grew up in the church. They're the church kids, so to speak. And now they're in this adult stage, right? And we asked them a lot of things, and I don't have time to go over all of this, but I want to just address a few things that relate very specifically to what we're going to be uh, talking about today. One of the questions we asked them is, does the Bible contain errors? And nearly 40% said yes, or they don't know. So to these young people, the Bible is not the inerrant, infallible Word of God, okay? It has mistakes in it. There's problems. And when we asked them, okay, if you think it has errors, what are those errors? Now, this is not a multiple choice question. They can answer however they want, and then we categorize those answers. And what was interesting 
interesting was that over 50% of their answers had something to do with the book of Genesis, um, that it was wrong about the age of the earth, that it's been disproved, and that it never flooded during Noah's time. Okay, so they're obviously having a lot of issues with that first book of the Bible. And when we asked them a question about the ark itself, was it actually built, or only a legend, 49%, almost half, said only a legend. Okay, even though it's in God's word, even though it's right there, they said it's only a legend. Now, I'm, you know, we might say, well, how is that possible? Because certainly when they went to church, they learned that the Bible was real because they saw these amazing pictures of Noah's Ark, right? I hear you laughing. That's what you should be doing, right? Um, and, and, you know, I can go to my local Christian bookstores and find books like these lining the shelves, right? So is the, fl- is the flood really about Noah's floating zoo and a year-long leisure cruise, right? A good old fun time there on Noah's Ark? Is it just a story or is it really true? Is it something that really happened? And does that even really matter to the Bible and for Christian? So what we want to do during our time today is kind of take a walk through the seven seas of history, which you see very much here at the Creation Museum. We want to discover the true history and the reality of Noah's Ark and Blood, why it is a real event and why it really does matter that it happened. So we have to start off with how do we get to this event in the first place, all right? And so let's start with creation, the very first sea. And we know from scripture it's very clear um, from the language that's there that God created in six 24-hour days, and he created different things on different days. And at the end of those six days, the creation was complete, and he rested on the seventh day. Now, those six days or those seven days occurred just a few thousand years ago because we can figure out the age of the earth and the universe from a lot from biblical genealogies or family trees that are given in scripture, but also from other events. We know that from Adam to Abraham was 2,000 years, Abraham to Christ is 2,000 years, and Christ to today is 2,000 years. So that gives us a grand total of 6,000 years, not millions and billions of years. And we know that that creation was very good. Okay, it is very much not like the world that we live in today, okay, because there was no death, no suffering, no disease, none of those things that we deal with. But it obviously didn't stay that way, and that brings us to the second C, which is corruption. And we know that Adam and Eve were told not to eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, but that is exactly what they did, right? That's what God told them, but they did that. They disobeyed God, they sinned, and the result of that sin, the punishment for that sin, was that there was now death and suffering in this world, okay? There was disease. That's because of man man's action, that is man's fault, um, that, this, that the world is basically the way that it is. Things die, things suffer because of that. Now that brings us to the third C, which is catastrophe, which obviously we're going to spend a lot of time on because this is a talk about Noah's Ark and the flood. And this is about 1,500 years after creation. And we really see, I think the Bible sums up for us the horrible and tragic effects of Adam's sin. This has been about 1,500 years worth of it. It says, And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And as bad as I think some of us might think things are today, I think they were certifiably worse then, right? Because only Noah was found righteous. Only he and his family were saved, along with the animals on on the ark. Now, in my experience, there are three big questions or three big areas that people typically have questions or objections um, when it comes to the reality of Noah's ark and the flood. And that is the ark itself, the animals that were on the ark, and then obviously the flood itself. So what we're going to do is kind of take a 30,000 foot view. And I'm going to answer those common questions and objections that people have to those three areas, so to speak. And then when you visit the ark or you look at our resources, it's going to go into a lot more detail. But let's just give you some things that you can use. You know, when people ask questions about this, because I hope that you're going to be telling a lot of people about coming to the ark and they're going to have questions, right? And I want you to have some answers to answer them. So the first one is how big was the ark? Now, like I said, many of us have become accustomed to images of the ark that look like this one. And we call these bathtub arcs, okay, because of the way that they're shaped, they kind of look like a bathtub or a fairy tale ark. And, um, but it's not realistic, right? This is totally not based on the dimensions that are given to us in scripture. I always say there is one thing I would, I would say is realistic about this ark, and that is this elephant right here, okay? Why do I say that? Because that elephant knows that when that wave hits an ark that is shaped like that, what's going to happen to the ark? It's going to flip, right? It's going to flip over. Everybody falls out, kind of defeats the whole purpose of it. So that's a problem with arcs that are shaped like that. And we talk about that at the ark encounter. But here's the thing. 
Christians are doing this, okay? Christians are portraying the ark like this. We're not, but a lot of Christians are. And here's the problem. The world mocks us, right? Well, it mocks us. And we have the biblical ark, the biblically sized one. But the world mocks Christians and says, ha ha, how can this be true? Well, no wonder if this is what they think we think the ark looked like. I don't blame them for making fun of us, okay? Uh, I mean, they have a right to if that's the way we portray the ark and that's the way we portray this event. I see why they're making fun of us because there's no way this is going to survive a year-long catastrophic flood, okay? It's not. So, um, so we have got to change that, okay? We can't keep doing this over and over and over again and presenting to our children, especially, that this is a fairy tale. That's, that's kind of, in essence, what we're doing when we portray it like this. Because I always say, it's not like we don't know the dimensions, because we do, okay? Um, we have that information in Scripture. We can certainly build, or, or at least um, when we draw images of it, make it a scale model of that. Um, we know that its length was 300 cubits, its width was 50 cubits, and its height was 30 cubits. You might say, that's nice, but I have no idea what a cubit is. Well, a cubit... It's a term of measure we don't really use anymore, but it's basically the length of an adult man's elbow to the tip of his middle finger. Now, depending on the guy, obviously that size is going to vary somewhat, and we don't know exactly what size cubit Noah used to build the ark, but we do know that in large-scale ancient construction projects, they typically use the long cubit, which is 20.4 inches, and that is what we use to build ark encounter. People say, is it actually built to the dimensions in scripture? And my answer is, yes, it's actually built um, to those exact dimensions. And so, if we do a little bit of math here, we can figure this out, that its length was 510 feet, its width was 85 feet, and its height was 51 feet. So that gives us a much, that gives us a very different looking arc, okay, than those bathtub arcs or those tail arcs that I showed you um, initially. And we don't even have to imagine how big it is because we can actually go and see that. <laughs> um, we can experience that. So when people ask me to describe the arc, I usually just say massive, okay, because it's the largest freestanding timber frame structure in the world, all right? Um, I've been at the Ark many days when there have been thousands of people there, and it can be kind of weird almost in some ways because you can be standing outside the Ark and you think, where is everybody? And it's like, oh, they're on the Ark um, because it can accommodate all those people, okay? It's not a problem. It's huge. Um, I sometimes do interviews with journalists, and they'll come to the Ark. They'll want to meet me there, and they'll say, okay, can you give us a quick tour of the Ark? And I'm like, uh, no. Okay, there, there's no such thing as a quick tour of this. Okay, it doesn't happen that way. Um, it's a football field and a half long. It's two school buses wide and approximately three giraffes stacked. Okay, so if you can imagine that, um, that does not even get you to the top of the bow fin, which is up here. That is about 10 stories off the ground. One of my favorite things to do is to go to either end of the arc and just kind of look up, right? And you get a sense, I think a sense of its size from that. Um, if you have walked all three decks, bow to stern, um, you'll get your, if you, if you have one of those, you know, watches where you have to close the activity circles and stuff, right? You're going to be able to do that at the Ark, okay? It's not going to be a problem with the walking there because it's, it's just a massive structure. Its volume is equivalent to nearly 500 semi-trailers, so you can put a lot of stuff in there. Now, another way to get a sense of its size would be to compare it to boats that have been built in more modern times. We can compare it to the Wyoming, um, which is uh, a large wooden ship built in more recent history. It was about 450 feet long, so the Ark is still longer than that. Now, it's not as big, as you notice here, as the Titanic or the Queen Mary too. But two things to note. One, those are steel boats, okay? And we're talking about a wooden ship here. Two, um, I'm pretty sure that Noah didn't need shuffleboard and swimming pools and golf courses and whatever else they have on cruise ships today, okay? And he might have liked those things, but he didn't need those things to survive the flood, right? So he, what he needed was a cargo ship, right? Because he had lots of cargo, the animal cargo, and their food and their water and things like that, and living space for he and his family. So he needed a very different type of ship. And research has actually been conducted on the Ark by engineers to understand that its dimensions are actually perfect for a cargo ship. We actually use similar dimensions today uh, for cargo ships because there's a lot of things that you have to factor in, but the three big ones are comfort, stability, and strength. And so 
when you look at the arc, it basically falls dead in the center of that triangle. So it's, it's a perfect balance, basically, of all three of those things when you have to take all three into account. Because if the arc was taller, longer, or wider, it would break apart, it would tip over, or the people and animals would be so sick that they wouldn't be able to survive. So it's giving you the, the, the best possible scenario, basically, for a ship this large. Now, there's been um, further study that's been done on the ARC. There was a study that was actually published in 1993 by Korean scientists who built a scale model of the ARC and put it out on the open ocean. They said, well, let's see if this is really something that happened. It's just really, you know, the dimensions that were given. Would it be seaworthy, right? Could it withstand the waves and things like that? So they put it out on the open ocean and declared, yes, it is a very seaworthy vessel. And I say, of course it is, right? Because God is the one that gave Noah the dimensions. Noah is the one that had the know-how to be able to execute that, put it together into something that would survive. Now, the reason that I do spend a lot of time on the size of the ark is one, because that's a big question we get, but two, because um, of how, how we're presenting this, right? To the world at large, but especially to our children. And one of the ways that we try to emphasize that at the ark is the fairy tale ark exhibit. And in it, we show a lot of those books and a lot of those toys that I've already um, shown you in this presentation. And because that, almost without fail, in our modern culture, this is how the ark is presented, as whimsical, cute, and fairy tale like Now, I've had people say to me, well, I think this is okay because, I mean, they're just kids, right? So it's okay to present it this way to them. And I, my response to that would be, not that they're just kids, they are kids. And they look to us for truth and for giving them truth. So when they look to us for truth and we present it like a fairy tale, what's going to happen? Okay? They're, they're not going to understand this correctly. And, and that is my issue with that. That's why it matters even more how we portray the ark, especially to our young people. Because you know what Satan's saying? He's saying, if I can convince you that the flood was not real, then I can convince you that heaven and hell are not real. I can convince you that lots of other things in the Bible aren't true either. And like I showed you with those millennials in that study we did, they didn't trust Genesis, right? Over 50% of them had major issues with Genesis. What I didn't show you was that a lot of them also have problems with other parts of the Bible as a result of that. There's other things in the Bible they're not believing either, okay? In other words, a lot of them think premarital sex is okay. A lot of them think abortion's okay. A lot of them think gay marriage is okay. I mean, it, the list just goes on and on. So not believing in one part of the Bible has led them to not believing many other things that God says as well. And this has been Satan's tactic from the beginning, right? When he talked to Eve in the garden, what did he say? Did God really say... I mean, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He got her to question God's word. And sadly, she believed him, right? She believed the lie that he was telling her. But he got her to question it. And as a result, she made a very poor choice. She sinned and Adam sinned. And it was obviously, we're all reaping um, the consequences of that. So what I'm saying is this is why it's a biblical authority issue. Is the Bible really true in all that it says or is it not, right? We have truth. Let's present it like truth, okay? So that's why it's so important that we portray the ark accurately. All right, let's talk about the animals. How did Noah fit all those animals on the ark? I honestly don't think this would be as much of a question if we actually portrayed the ark accurately, okay? Because when we show these cutesy little arcs, it's hard to think about all those animals on there. But when you know how big it really is, right, and its volume is equivalent to nearly 500 semi-trailers, it's a little bit easier to think about how those animals get fit on there. But, just to play devil's advocate here, there are a lot of animals in the world today, right? Most modern estimates would say there's about 8 million species of organisms, both marine and land animals, that includes insects, all of that in the world today. Okay, so let's just say Noah had to take two of each of those, even though we know he had to take seven pairs of sun. Let's just say two, because the math is easier. That's 16 million animals uh, that he would have to take on the ark. So I found like the absolute worst possible picture I could find. Um, whoa, okay, that one's just really, really busy. But so even with a biblically sized ark, Okay, like we have down at Ark Encounter, think this only worse, okay? Um, because that's what you can't fit 16 million animals on even a biblically sized Ark. It's not going to work. Um, it's going to be a problem. And when Bill Nye, um, the science guy, debated Ken Ham on this very stage just a few years ago, this was one of the questions he asked. He said, how can you put, four, his number was 14 million. He said, how can you put 14 million animals on the Ark? All right, so I always say, let's talk about that. It's a valid question. And there's three, I have a threefold answer basically to that question. 
The first one is that Noah, we have to remember Noah only had to take the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. He did not have to take the sea creatures because there was plenty of water, right? And we know that from scripture because it says of the birds after their kind, of the animals after their kind, and of the creeping things, okay? Those are the things that are gonna go on board. So if you eliminate the marine species, okay, every marine species from that list, that number is gonna drop dramatically, that eight million. Um, insects, we don't really know because they're technically not air breathers. They could survive in other forms outside the ark um, during the flood. But even if he did have to take them, they wouldn't take up a lot of space. But if they didn't have to take them, again, that number is going to drop dramatically because marine species and um, insect species, that's some of the most species we have in the entire world. Uh, mammals as a whole make up a very small number compared to that. All right. Next part of the answer, he brought young adults. And when I say Noah brought them, okay, we have to keep in mind, God brought the animals to Noah, Noah then took them on the ark. And the reason I say young adults is because it's clear and clear in scripture that God tells Noah to bring a male and a female to keep them alive on the face of all the earth. The whole idea is reproduction, right, after the flood, because you, you wiped everything out, so you gotta start all over again. So it would make sense to bring younger animals because they have the longest reproductive life ahead of them, right? You're not gonna bring animals that are really old and past that, that doesn't, that's not going to help you, right? So they're gonna bring young animals that have that reproductive life ahead of them. Also, the smaller, the younger the animal is, the smaller it is, the less space it takes up, the less food, the less waste, all of those things, okay? So that all works out really well for this particular event. Now, the last point of this, I want to spend just a little bit more time on because as a biologist, this is something that's very important to me, and that's it. Noah had to take two of each kind, not two of each species, right? So just like we asked the question, what is a cubit? We might say, well, what is a kind? Because we do see that word used over and over in the Genesis account of creation and the Genesis account of the flood. It says that the birds after their kind, after their kind, after their kind, two of every kind, okay? So we see that word. So what is a kind? And most modern biblical creationists would say that kind is the same as family when you talk about modern taxonomy. So I know you all remember this, right, from biology class. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. This is how we classify every single living organism on the planet. And family is highlighted in blue there because that's where we believe the kind level falls. Now, why do we do that? It's not arbitrary, okay? We just didn't pick it because it's nice. But we picked it because most animals within a family can mate with one another and produce offspring, even if they're different genus and different species. So to give you an example of that, all of the members um, of Canidae, okay, which is the dog family, they can mate and produce offspring, okay? So we have koi dogs, which are coyote and domestic dog, or wolf dogs, which is wolf and domestic dog. There's even um, been some fox hybrids, okay, because foxes are in that too. So these, these can they're a reproductive unit, basically, okay? And since the whole idea was reproduction after the flood, it seems to make a lot of sense that kind would fall at the family level. The same is true for cats, okay? The Felidae family. We can link all of them together, basically, through their ability to mate and produce offspring. Now, we have some great examples of that here at the Creation Museum in our petting zoo when you see our Zorst and our Zonkey, okay? And when you first look at them, you might think, what is that, okay? Because it kind of looks like a combination, which is a really good description of what it is. These are hybrids, okay? And the reason they're called hybrids is because their parents are different species, okay? They're in the same family, but different species. So the Zorus is the brown guy here. So the parents are a um, horse and a zebra. And the donkey, obviously, you can probably figure that out, okay? The parents, just by looking at it, the parents are a zebra and a donkey. Now, how is that possible? Because horses, zebras, and donkeys all belong to the family Equidae, and they can mate with one another and produce offspring, right? Most of us are familiar with mules, right? The same idea, okay? Horses and donkeys. But again, it's possible because they belong to the same family. So when Noah was taking dogs, for example, on board the ark, even though there's about, you know, anywhere between three and 400 breeds of dogs today, he wasn't taking 400 pairs of dogs on the ark, okay? Noah never saw a chihuahua, just saying. So, and we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? Those are modern breeds. Those are things we have today. They weren't around at that time. So Noah wasn't doing that. He was taking two dogs on the ark. And from those two dogs, after they got off the ark, they multiplied and reproduced and multiplied and reproduced. And today we get lots of dogs, okay, as a result of that. 
And we get all those dogs breeds and all those dog species um, that we have today. And it does not matter what type of dog you're talking about, whether it's the fox or the jackal or the bush dog or the d-hole or the coyote or the wolf or your favorite domestic breed. It doesn't matter. They're all dogs. Now, some people would say, wait a minute. You're saying there were two dogs on the ark, and from those two dogs, we get all the different species and breeds that we have today. That seems like a lot of change in only a few thousand years. Okay, well, first of all, it has been a few thousand years, okay? So that is a lot of time. You have to realize there are only 35 species of dogs in the world today. All domestic dogs and the wolf are Canis lupus. They're all the same species, okay? So it's only 35 in a few thousand years. That's not really that challenging to do, okay? Um, and, and to help you understand that a little bit better, okay, I want to talk about breeds specifically, okay? All of the dog breeds that we have today have come about in the last 500 years. 500 years. That's all it took to get um, something as different as a Great Dane, right, and a Yorkshire Terrier. <laughs> now, they're pretty different, right? But you realize they're the same species, they're just a different breed. And people have done that in 500 years. Now, how have people done this? Because they've selected for or against certain traits, right, as they breed them. And so we can get these different things as a result of this, what we call artificial selection. Now, what I think is kind of ironic or funny, so people have been able to do this, and there's obviously, like I say, between three and 400 breeds in just 500 years. But let's look at the wolf and the coyote. These are obviously wild species of dogs. Do you realize, now, I, just my looking at this, the wolf and the coyote look pretty similar, don't you agree? Right? A lot more similar than that Great Dane and Yorkshire Terrier. But do you realize the wolf is Canis lupus, so he's actually, the wolf is the same species as these two, <laughs> okay? The coyote is Canis latrans. He's a different species. Okay, so all we're asking for in about, you know, just a few thousand years is you to get these differences in the wild. Not too challenging, right? We're really not talking about that big of a difference. If people can do the Great Dane and Yorkshire Terry in 500 years, right, and get those amazing differences there and, and those purebreds, imagine what you can do in a few thousand right? And that's not people selecting, that's natural mechanisms like natural selection and other genetic, and other genetic things that even occur. But we can get that. And we're not talking about huge differences here. We're talking about small differences um, that we can get in that period of time. So it really isn't that hard to imagine that. And the other thing to consider is that dogs are some of the most speciose organisms, uh, speciose mammals. Most, most animals don't have this many species. Most mammals don't. Giraffes have like three or five, you know, they don't really have that many. So it's not really that much change we're asking for in a few thousand years. What it does show us, when you look at all these, it's amazing to me to think about the genetic diversity that God created in this kind. And we get to see that come out as we select, as nature selects, and we get to see that in these many different animals that we have today within the dog kind. Now, when we knew we were going to build the ark, we're like, okay, we have to figure out how, we have to give a reasonable estimate for how many animals were on the ark. And so we took it, um, so we did a lot of research on that. We published papers on that. They're available freely online um, or um, in a book form. And they're fascinating reading, at least to me as a biologist, but it's neat to see that. Um, but I want to give you a summary of that, okay? So of all the kinds that would have had to went on the ark, taking it usually at about the family level, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower, we did the research on that to take all living animals and all animals only known from the fossil record and classify them into their original kinds, okay? That's a huge undertaking. But we did that. And so what we came up with is mammals and another group that's totally extinct called non-mammalian snapsids. We have about 550 kinds. For birds, we have a little under 300 kinds. For reptiles, a little over 300 kinds. And then amphibians, about 250 kinds, which gives us a grand total of about 1,400 kinds or right around 7,000 animals. Okay. So then that's probably, that's definitely an overestimate, okay? It probably was less than that, but we're being generous, so to speak, on that number to show how we could have put all those animals on there, taken care of them, given them food, water, all of those things. But what animal do you think I get asked about most when it comes to the ark? Which animal is it? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Now, sometimes people say unicorn, right? And I say, 
You need to go to the ark and you need to look at that exhibit because we talk about that, right? I'm not going to answer that. So were dinosaurs on the ark? The number one question I got asked on opening day um, of the ark. And I say, of course they were, because what does the Bible say? It says, of every living thing of all flesh, animals after their kind will come to you to keep them alive. That includes the dinosaurs, okay? And, and we need to realize there's lots of animals. I think we often think about it, well, I'm gonna talk about that for a number of reasons, but we need to realize lots of animals are no longer here, right? It's not just the dinosaurs. Lots of mammals have died out, we no longer have. Lots of reptiles, lots of amphibians, lots of birds, okay? So um, they just have died out, they went extinct, and we no longer have them around. Dinosaurs are not a problem. We all have watched way too much Jurassic World and Jurassic Park, I'm just saying, because We've got this idea that all dinosaurs are either gargantuan, right, or they're really tiny, and of course we all know it's the really tiny ones you have to be scared of um, if you watch enough of these movies, right? That's the idea. What is the reality, okay, because that's not the reality. The reality is that most dinosaurs are about the size of a buffalo, so think large cow, okay? That's it. They're not huge, they're not little, and if they were, some of them did get really big, there's no doubt about that, but they were probably very old. Um, and so, so, again, Noah's not going to take those, God's not going to bring those, because they don't have the longest reproductive life ahead of them. Now, again, Noah would, and God would have brought to Noah the young dinosaurs, the juvenile dinosaurs, because they have the longest reproductive life. So Noah was not trying to do this. Um, an adult-sized sauropod would have a hard time fitting through the door. Now, he'd fit, actually, once he got on there, but he'd have a hard time getting through that door. Instead, Noah's taking the, the young ones, which just makes sense. Everything starts out small, including dinosaurs, right? The largest dinosaur eggs are about the size of a football, okay? So it's not a problem to take them on board the ark. People say, okay, that's nice, but what did T-Rex eat, all right? Because he's a carnivore. Well, I think there's two possibilities. One, they were, all they were given was, was, fruits and veggies, so to speak, or grain. They had a vegetarian diet for a period of time. This is about surviving. It's not about what they want. Um, it's about what they get. And there are known carnivores today that survive strictly on vegetarian diets. They can do just fine. Okay, so it's not necessarily a requirement. If it was a requirement for some reason, then Noah could have taken dried meat for them. There's only about 60 to 80 dinosaur kinds total, so you're talking less than 200 dinosaurs. Even though we get asked about them most, they're actually the minority on the ark. Um, mammals, birds, all of those would have way outnumbered uh, the number of dinosaurs on the ark. So we see the stegosaurus kind here um, that we have on the ark, as well as the sauropod kind. Now again, these guys are going to grow up to be some of the big biggest land animals on the planet, but they start out small, right? Just like everything else. So we talked about the ark, we talked about the animals, now I want to talk about the flood itself. Um, because if there is a flood that covered the entire world, we should have evidence of that, right? Because the thing I, I like people to understand is that Christians have a reasoned faith. We do not have a blind one. So there are certain things we expect to see based on scripture in the world. So we see those things, and that confirms and supports what God's word says. So we have a reasoned faith. Now, one of the things that sort of crept into the church, sadly, and into the Christian community as a whole is, well, maybe there was a flood, but it was just a local flood. It was just the area in which Noah lived. It didn't cover the entire world. But I have some basic questions to ask um, about that idea. And first of all is, why did Noah have to build an ark? And these are just common sense questions, right? Because he could have just went elsewhere, right? It was, if it was just local, that was a lot of time and effort put into something when he could have went somewhere where the flood wasn't. Same is true for the animals. Why did God send them to the ark when he could have just sent them somewhere else where the flood wasn't? Now, the third point, though, with this, and I think is the most crucial for us to understand is, after the flood was over, God put a rainbow in the sky. And that rainbow, regardless of what the culture says today, that rainbow was a sign that he would never flood the world again. It was a sign of his promise, okay? So every time we see a rainbow, that's what we need to think. It's a sign of God's promise to us that he would never flood the world again. Now, have we had lots of local floods since Noah's day? Yeah, okay? We live near the Ohio River here. Um, I live over on the Indiana side, and sometimes it's challenging to get to work because the river floods the roadway, and it's hard to get past that. So we've had lots of local floods since Noah's day. So if Noah's flood was a local flood, and God put a rainbow in the sky and said he'd never do this again, what's the problem? God has broken his promise many times over, right? Because we've had lots of local floods since Noah's day. And the problem with that is God doesn't lie. God doesn't break his promises. We know that from scripture. So that cannot, it cannot have been a local flood. And there's no reason to think it was a local flood from the text. Because it says all flesh is on the earth. Everything that is on the earth shall die. 
I think that's pretty clear, okay? It says that all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered, um, about 15 cubits upward. That's about 23, 25 feet. So take a look at this picture and think about how that works when you have a local flood, okay? Does water work like this? No, or act like this, right? I mean, if you have a bathtub and you turn the water on and you don't turn the water off, does it stop when it gets to the top of the tub? No, right? Because water seeks its own level, okay? It's not going to do this. This is not how water works. So you can't have it just the high hills where Noah lived, okay? It's going to have to be, it's going to have to be something that's universal to make that statement as it's read in scripture. And again, like I said, it's, it's clear. All, all, only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. We go to the New Testament. We could look at Jesus and his disciples talking about this event, and they use the exact same terminology. So it's it's clear that we are talking about a global catastrophic flood. That only Noah and his family and the animals on the ark um, survived that, or at least the air-breathing land-dwelling animals survived that. Now, again, if there's been a flood of that magnitude, there should be some evidence, right? Um, because again, we have a reasoned faith, not a blind one. And so we're going to look at two major evidences, and that's the rock layers and the fossils. Now let's talk about the rock layers first, because many of us have been taught that the rock layers um, and other geological structures like canyons take millions of years to form. And we're used to seeing these geological columns, so to speak, that supposedly represent time. So the lower that you go in the rock record, okay, the lower down here you go, the older it is, the older the rocks are, the older the fossils are, and the, and the further up you go, the younger the rocks are, and the younger the fossils are, and that's supposedly how it works. But the question is, is that really true? Or can these types of things form very quickly under the right condition? So we're going to watch a short video about the Mount St. Helens eruption that occurred back in 1980. Um, a vast majority of people in this room can remember that. I remember watching it on TV. It was pretty cool. Um, and what that um, event showed, not just in 1980, but even in the years following, that rock layers and canyons and other structures can actually form quickly under the right conditions, like a catastrophe. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, located 95 miles south of Seattle, Washington, erupted. The eruption was triggered by an earthquake centered beneath the mountain that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale. The lateral blast swept out the north side of Mount St. Helens at 300 miles per hour, with temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit and the power of 24 megatons of thermal energy, it snapped 100-year-old trees like toothpicks and stripped them of their bark. Before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud, complete with perpendicular side canyons. Canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Mud flows over the following decade cut hundreds of feet into solid rock in just days of cutting time. Fallen trees formed a log mat on the surface of Spirit Lake and dropped bark to the bottom of the lake, accumulating up to three feet of bark peat in just a couple years. and vertically floating logs sinking to the bottom of the lake resulted in buried trees in only a decade. Similar to the trees of Yellowstone's fossil forest, which are also buried in volcanic layers. Even though Mount St. Helens is a very small catastrophe compared to the flood, or the major catastrophes immediately following the flood, it provides a better clue to what happened in those times than the slow geologic processes which are most commonly seen in the present. Okay, so what this showed us, a lot can happen, right? 
if you have the right catastrophic conditions, which we did at Mount St. Helens. They talked about these rock layers here. You can see the person at the bottom for an idea of scale. This is a lot of rock, right? And it was laid down in just a few hours. It didn't take millions of years. It just took the right conditions. They talked a little bit about this canyon called Engineer's Canyon. This was carved out in nine hours. <laughs> That's all it took. Right? It just took the right condition. So it's great observable evidence that it does not take millions of years for these types of structures to form. Now, they talked about this canyon. It's actually quite similar in layout to the Grand Canyon. Now, it's a lot smaller, but similar in layout. And if you go to Engineers Canyon today, there's a river that cuts through the canyon. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, we know that that river did not make that canyon, right? Because we observed it in the present. Well, I'm going to tell you the same is true if you go to the big one, okay? That river didn't make that canyon either. Um, and that's what you'll hear, that that river carved it out over millions of years. Now, there's lots of reasons why that is totally implausible, but just to share with you one of them, see the sides of the canyon and how steep they are, okay? How many have been to the Grand Canyon? I have. I've whitewater rafted down that part, okay, right? The, it's really steep because you look up and the sun it doesn't even stay in the sky very long because it's just you're so crowded in because those, those sides are really, really steep. If it was millions of years old, those sides would not be that steep. They'd be whoo, Okay, they'd be laid back, they'd be all rotted away. They wouldn't look like that. And so that's just one evidence that it cannot be millions of years old. All right, let's move on and talk about the fossils. And one of my absolute favorite finds when it comes to fossils is that we find soft tissue in dinosaur bones. All right, now, why is that so surprising? Because tissue doesn't last millions of years, right? And even though, um, and, and so that's a major problem because all dinosaur bones are dated to at least 65 million years old or older. So, um, as a biologist and someone who has worked with tissues and cells and DNA and proteins in the lab, there's no way they can last millions of years, right? Even under pristine conditions, even when I freeze them to minus 80 degrees Celsius or put them in pure liquid nitrogen, it's, it, it can be a struggle. You gotta be really consistent with it. You gotta hope the electric doesn't go out. You gotta, put, you know, all of these things to keep these things preserved and in good shape. So there's no way that you would expect to see this under a microscope when you look at a dinosaur fossil. Because what are you seeing here? This is bone, obviously, that they're looking at. But what you're seeing here are blood vessels, branching blood vessels. Bones has a lot of them. Bone has a lot of them. It's very vascular. What about these little reddish brown structures right here that look really round? Those are red blood cells in the blood vessels, all right? Now, when they first saw this, they were like, no way. <laughs> this can't be because there should be no structure left. It should be completely, completely obliterated because it's been millions of years, right? That's the idea. But it's not. It's there. And in fact, if you look at it, this is just one sample. It's stretchy. Okay, and it looks like fresh bone. I actually worked with bone for my graduate study, so I'm very familiar with how this should look. If I didn't know any better, I'd say that's fresh bone, but it's not. Okay, it's from a fossil that's supposedly millions of years old. So I want you to listen to Dr. Mary Schweitzer. She was one of the first scientists to really study this and popularize it, and listen to what she says about her discovery. I'm not going to believe this. But when she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched and it sproined and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it, that's not possible. We need to do it again and again. It's one of those just goosebump inducing scientific moments, that's all I can say. And I, they don't really happen very often. Blood vessels should not exist in fossilized bone. Many scientists believe organic molecules can't last more than 100,000 years. Yet Schweitzer's bone is 68 million years old. Or is it? <laughs> right? That's really the question. Because she even said, I don't believe it. That's not possible. You need to do it again. She's taken a huge amount of heat for this find. Okay? Huge. Right? Because it shouldn't be there if millions of years is true. Now, her lab and other labs, but especially her lab, is trying to find a way. You know what they're spending their time and money on now? Is how these tissues could have lasted millions of years. Well, here's what I don't think they're ever going to find a way that tissues can last millions of years. They're just too fragile for that. You know what the better explanation is? It's only a few thousand years old. 
fossils <laughs> um, because it was fossilized at the time of the flood because it was buried and preserved very, very quickly by a huge catastrophic flood that buried it deeply so that it could not fall apart. It could not decay that quickly. And that's why we dig it up and that's why we see it today, right? That is a much better explanation and it's absolutely consistent with what we would expect to see based on scripture. Now, creation scientists are doing active research in this area as well. I just went to a meeting of creation scientists where they talked about this in detail. And um, this is an electron micrograph picture of a, um, um, uh, triceratops horn that has been dated to be millions of years old. And what you are seeing here is a type of bone cell called an osteocyte. These are mature bone cells, and they have these tiny little fragile like tendr tendrils that come off of them. It's how they communicate with other cells and, other, and the bone. Um, they're very fragile, and there is no way I would expect to see that on something that's millions of years old. They should have all broken off. You shouldn't have any cellular structure at all, but yet that's what you see. And you compare it to fresh bone, it's actually difficult to tell the difference. Again, it's just further evidence that's, that's saying these things cannot be millions of years old, okay? They're, only, they're absolutely consistent with being only a few thousand years old and formed at the time of the flood. So that's just two issues, okay, in dealing with the flood and evidence is for the flood. Obviously, there's many more, but we've answered questions now about these three big issues, the ark, the animals, and the flood. And so I want to talk about the rest of the seas, and believe it or not, I can do it in 15 minutes, okay? Because uh, we're not going to spend it long on each of those, but I want to talk to you about this because I want you to understand this is why it matters, okay? That's what I want you to understand by going through the rest of these. So let's talk about the fourth sea confusion. This is about 100 years after the flood. And Noah and his family were told to multiply and fill the earth. Well, they multiplied, but they didn't fill the earth. They built this tower, and which was called the Tower of Babel, because God came down and confused their language. Okay, and as a result, they, multi they, they migrated out and they filled the earth. And from that, we actually get the formation of the different people groups all over the world. We're one race, because we all come from Adam and Eve, but we're different people groups, we're different ethnicities as a result of this event. Now, what's really interesting is in every, almost every culture of the world, there is a legend about a flood. There's over three 300 of them. Now, how is it that people on completely different sides of the planet are telling about a similar account, all right, a similar story? Well, because it's based on the real one. <laughs> it's based on the one that's found in scripture. See, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they were all alive at the time of the Tower of Babel. They were there, right? And the, the ancestors of all of these different people groups were there. They heard firsthand this account. Now, the problem is they changed it, right? As they went to other places, they added things, they took things away. And so it has some similarities to the real account in scripture, but some things are different as well that make them impossible and mythical, but they're based on the real thing. So that's creation, corruption, catastrophe, and confusion. Those are found in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and they really do matter. They, those first four seas really provide the history and the foundation that's necessary for these last three seas, starting with the sea of Christ. Um, the birth of Christ is actually first promised in Genesis. Do you realize that? The first messianic prophecy is in Genesis. Because right after Adam and Eve sinned, when God is cursing the serpent, cursing Satan, he says this, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, the capital S. That is a direct reference to Jesus Christ. So right after Adam and Eve sinned, God gives the promise of the seed that would come and crush the head of Satan and have victory over sin and death. And he does this through the cross, which is the next seed. Jesus' death and resurrection fulfills the promise given in Genesis 3.15. God makes it clear that Adam is the problem, is why there is sin. Okay, the problem of sin, Jesus is the solution to sin. We have bad news in Genesis. We have sin. We have good news in Jesus Christ. And, and it's clear in the, from the New Testament as well. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ. All shall be made alive. And so it is written, the first man, Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So we have that very obvious connection. And that's why I keep saying that Genesis is so important because the gospel is rooted in the history of Genesis, right? We need to understand that. And um, so, but I think there's another connection that we can draw here as well. And that is with the ark and the fact that it had one door in which the animals and Noah's family entered. There was no other way onto the ark. And we know from 2 Peter that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, we don't know exactly what Noah said because it's not recorded in scripture, but I can't help but think if he's a preacher of righteousness, that he was telling people to repent of their sins and worship the one true God because he knew what was happening. He knew what was going to come, right? He was building this ark and it took him many years to do this. And so I'm sure he had opportunities to speak about this because he knew that once he and his animals and the family entered the ark, 
that woke you up, right? That God would shut the door. And God is patient, but he is just. And once that door was shut, after likely many years of Noah's preaching of repentance and calling people to worship God, it was now too late for anyone to change their mind. And so God judged their sinfulness with a global catastrophic flood. But the door in the ark reminds me of another one, right? Because what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, paid the penalty for our sins, and he is the only way by which we can be saved. And how are we saved? It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And it's really important that we make that decision now because just as there was a judgment in Noah's time, there's another one coming and that's told to us in Second Peter. It said, the scoffers will come in the last days. Now, people will ask me, when are the last days? I'm like, the last 2,000 years, right? This is since Jesus has died and resurrected, then we're in the last days at that point. And we certainly have a lot of scoffers, right, in this day and age of Christianity. They'll say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Oh, everything is just going on. Same as yesterday. Same will be today. Same will be tomorrow. And it says, for this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and they are standing out of the water and in the water. So they scoff at creation and by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. They'll scoff at the flood. And we see this today. We see people denying the biblical account of creation, denying the biblical account of the flood. And because they don't believe that history in Genesis is true, they don't believe that gospel that's rooted in that history is true either. But Peter warns us another judgment is coming. Now, it won't be a flood, right? Because God promised, sent the rainbow, said he'd never do that again, but it will be by fire and it will burn, right? It's all going to burn, literally. Um, but God is patient, and he wants people to repent, and he wants them to be saved. It says he's long-suffering to what is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Think about it. It's been 6,000 years. That's a lot more patience than I have, okay? He's been doing that because he is God, right? And he wants people to come to know him as his personal, uh, come to know him as his personal savior. Just as Noah and his family were saved by going through the door, that one door of the ark, God wants people to be saved by going through the door of his son, Jesus Christ. And, and that, as, to me, as a Christian, because that is God want, that is what God wants, that's what I want. Because I know there's going to be a consummation, there is going to be a final judgment, and there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And I know for a fact, that I will be there with God. I have no doubt about it, that I will be with him in that new heaven and new earth. And I want everyone in this room to be there with me. I do. Um, that is my greatest desire. I want everyone that's listening to this um, to be there with me. Um, and, and, so, and they can if they know Christ as their Savior. It really is as simple as that. But I want to go back. I want to end with something I talked about at the very beginning of this presentation. And that's young people. Um, I have a real heart for young people. I really do. Um, my daughter is 15. <laughs> and so she is growing up in a very different world from the one that I grew up in, right? And I see a lot of you shaking your head. And if you're older than me by 10 or 20 years, you really see a difference, okay? You see a bigger difference than I do. And Satan is very much trying to convince young people um, that Genesis is not true, that the Bible is not true, that you can't trust God's word, and wants them to question all of it. And, um, and so we have, a great, um, we have a great burden, we have a great opportunity then to give those answers, biblical answers, and look at things like science and archaeology and history and show how they support and confirm God's word. We've got to be doing that. The problem is we haven't been for the last 50 years, for the last 100 years. And the problem is now, because we don't have those, we didn't have those answers, we haven't been able to give them to the children, and the children are grow up, growing up without these, and they're leaving the church, and they're walking away. And that's what's happened. And I don't think people have done this intentionally, but unintentionally, by not having answers to the questions that, of our era and the questions people are asking, children have been led astray. Okay, and they're walking away from the church. So let me give you an example of that. Let's say little Johnny here, he comes to church on Sunday and he hears a Sunday school teacher talk about the ark. Chances are she'll show him a picture like this because it's rampant throughout Sunday school curriculum. So that's what Johnny thinks the ark looks like. He goes out there into the rest of the world the rest of the week, right? And he's confronted by movies and books and TV and teachers and friends and the internet. And they say, hey, Johnny, where'd all that water come from? I mean, come on, that would be a lot of water to cover the entire world. And there's no way all those animals could fit on that ark. I mean, come on, that little ark, they're all 
all going to fall off. And rock layers, everyone knows those take millions of years to form. Science proves it. Um, a global flood's just not possible. Everyone knows that Noah's flood is a myth, Johnny. And the reason it's a myth, well, Johnny, everyone knows the Bible isn't true, right? And you could say this, put, fill in the blank with any number of things right? We could talk about the definition of marriage. We could talk about the sanctity of life. We could talk about any of those things. And so what happens, right? That little ark is just going to sink. It can't withstand those questions. So maybe he goes back and asks the teacher, but she doesn't know, right? Because it's been going on for a long time. That's the problem. And so she says, well, no, Johnny, let's talk about Jonah and the big fish. Or Johnny, I don't know, just trust in Jesus. And you know what Johnny says as he gets older? Well, if that story in Genesis isn't true about Noah and the ark, because how could that possibly happen? There's no way a man could live in the belly of a fish for three days. And everyone knows that virgins don't give birth and dead people don't come back to life. Right? So none of it's true. And he walks away. So what do we need to do? Because I don't want to be all gloom and doom, but what I want to tell you is, and I want to challenge you, is to have a defense, an answer, because that's what we're called to do. It says we're to be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And this is about the gospel. It's about the authority and the truthfulness of all of God's word from beginning to end. It's about the, the gospel that's rooted in the history of Genesis, right? We've got to be giving those answers. And guess what? You don't have to have a PhD to do it, okay? I don't have a PhD in geology or astronomy or any of those areas, right? But I have to be able to give answers for those. And because we have to do that, we have to show them pictures of the ark that look like this. Please do not show those other pictures anymore. We've got to get rid of those, right? We really, really do because we've got truth. Let's present it like truth. Let's help connect God's word to God's world. Let's help them know that they have a reasoned faith and their answers to their questions about how Noah fit the animals on the ark and how the rock layers are formed quickly and the fossils were formed quickly. And you know, any area that I'm not an expert in and someone starts asking me questions that are above my knowledge thing, which isn't going to take a whole lot to get there. Okay. In certain areas, especially geology and astronomy. Okay. I, they have got experts that have written books here, that you can access and articles online and all kinds of great resources that they can get from people that do have expertise in those areas so that they know the account of the ark is true and that account of Jonah is true and that account of Christ is true. When it comes in this day and age, when it comes to teaching children, I do not use the term Bible story anymore. Story is out of my vocabulary. And the reason for it is because most children today would account story with something that is not true. It is fiction. It is a fairy tale. I never want them to think that the Bible is a bunch of stories or fiction or fairy tale. It is accounts. It is events. It is history. It is real. And that's what we need to be helping them understand. So we connect God's word to God's world and they have answers. And so when they go out there in the world and they're confronted by all those things, because they still will be, okay, we can shelter them to a degree. And I think we should shelter them to a degree. But at the same time, they're going to be confronted and they're going to have to have answers. And when they do, what that means means is they're going to stay in the church and they're going to be equipped and they're going to pass that information down to the next generation. Because as much as I love being with you all here today, and I really do because I really love what I do, the, the best thing that I will ever do in this life is to raise a child that loves and serves God and lives for him. That is the, the bestest thing I can ever think of, okay? It really is. That is my legacy, <laughs> That's what I want to be my legacy. And, and so we have to be thinking about this. Yes, the world is getting darker, okay? You're living under a rock if you think otherwise. <laughs> um, it is getting darker, okay? Everyone knows that everyone admits that. It doesn't mean we run and hide, okay? It doesn't mean we stick our head in the sand. What it means is that we become equipped. We have answers to the questions that people are asking, and we give that to the next generation, right? And we raise a generation that loves and serves God and lives for him. And as the darkness gets darker, we got to think about this, light shines brighter in the darkness. So I think we have amazing opportunities to evangelize and tell people about the truth of God's word and about Christ, but we have to answer the questions they're asking, okay? And do we have answers to those questions? Um, some people might say, well, what about things like homosexuality? What about things like um, transgender? And what, what about those things? Guess where the answers to all of those start? Genesis right? Think about it. God made man and woman, right? God made them in his image. That's why abortion is wrong. God made marriage and defined it as between one man and one woman. Where, where does all that come from? Where does it all start? Genesis, it literally is the foundation and the Bible just builds on all of those other things. So we have to be giving those answers and be equipped to give those answers. So let me tell you some resources that can help you do this because I'm going to tell you, and 
It's like, I can't say this enough. It has been something that has been so confidence building for me as a Christian, right? And I didn't learn all this overnight, but um, I did learn it. And it's helped me to really be able to be effective in talking to people about the Bible and about Christ. So especially my kid. So that, that's the most important thing to me. So uh, we have a newsletter. This comes out once a month. You can sign up online um, or, um, or we have a little form that you can fill out too. But you'll get a free download of um, Ken Ham's Fire in My Bones, which is his testimony. Um, he is the CEO and it is really powerful for understanding uh, why this ministry exists and why we do what we do. If you want to see how the Ark Encounter was built or you want to read more about it, we've got some great tools, a DVD and a book to help give you the detail and the nitty gritty, so to speak, on that. If you want to learn more about the animals on the ark, I love this book. We, read it at a, we wrote it at a lay person level so that everyone can really understand how do we get those numbers? Um, how did we um, understand the kinds and all of that? This is actually one of my favorite books. I will admit that, that even though I'm a biologist and this is about engineering, I like it because it's, it's about how did Noah take care of 7,000 animals, right? How did he get rid of waste products of 7,000 animals? How did he feed 7,000 animals or, you know, less? But how did he do that. And so I love, I love reading about that. A flood of evidence. A lot of the things I covered today and many, many more are covered in this really, it's kind of a good general Q&A about the flood and the ark. A great DVD by Dr. Terry Mortensen, Noah's Flood Thinking Outside the Box, or sorry, um, Washing Away the Millions of Years. Noah's Ark Thinking Outside the Box has more to do with the shape of the ark, which I didn't really have time to get into. But Tim Lovett, who's an engineer, has studied this in great detail, and he gives a lot of good information on that DVD. The Flood of Noah, this is about all those legends of Noah all over the world and the flood and how they compare to the biblical account. If you want to learn more the sort of the backstory of Noah, there's a set of three books in this, actually, um, that are historical fiction, but they aim to kind of give an understanding of what happened happened to um, Noah and his life building up to the flood itself. Lots of great children's resources. Can I please ask you to get these <laughs> so that children have a right view, okay? So they're not questioning it. So they're not seeing those fairy tale arcs, right? And they're seeing the real thing. And it's for Noah, a special door, remarkable rescue, great books for that. The Lie of Evolution in Millions of Years by Ken Ham. Great book, along with Gospel Reset. How do we evangelize? Why is what we do here? Why do we do what we do? Um, next to the Bible, um, this is the textbook of our ministry. This is. This is why we do what we do next to the Bible. And understanding what the Bible says and trying to live that out and trying to evangelize and try to help people have answers to these questions. Um, ready to Return. I talked a little bit about the millennial study that we've done. The answer is books one, two, three, and four. I love these. I use these all the time. Where did King and his wife? How many day means a day? What about radiometric dating? What about dinosaurs? What about alien? And we have versions of that for teens as well as versions of that for children because we really want everyone to be equipped. We have a, a brand new book out called Glass House, Shattering the Myth of Evolution. Um, I'm going to be down at the Ark here in just a few hours actually talking about some of the, the, the things in there. Are humans and chimps related? Uh, no, but why? Okay, let's talk about that. Let's look at the evidence and see why that myth of evolution is wrong. Um, we have our YouTube special. You want to look for books, DVDs, and CDs that have a little green dot on them. Make that perfect package for your family. Answers Magazine. Um, the next issue that's going to come out, I am super excited about, not just because I wrote an article for it, but... Um, I am excited about it because it's going to be talking about the issue of sexuality because we are a culture in crisis. And so how do we look at that? How do we deal with that? So you want to subscribe to this magazine. It's all about building that biblical worldview. It has a special kids section in each issue. Um, and how do, we, how do we build that biblical worldview? How do we answer the questions in our society and our church effectively? You'll get a digital, if you sign up for the print edition, you get the digital subscription for free. You can download it on as many devices as you want. We have a special going on right now with Pure Flix, which which is a Christian alternative to Netflix, family-friendly, faith-affirming movies. All of Answers in Genesis DVDs are on there. So if you sign up for this special, which will give you a little brochure on that as you leave, you get a month, you get, oh, sorry, you get a year subscription to Answers Magazine, a year subscription to Pure Flix, you get the newsletter, you get like eight downloads. So lots of great things for like $99. So it really is a good deal for a whole year of that. Begin is our book for new believers and unbelievers. It has portions of scripture with some commentary to kind of tie it all together. What does it mean to be saved and answers to 10 most asked questions? This is the Bible in a nutshell is what I call it. It's a big picture view of scripture. That's available out here for $3. We have our pocket guides for $2 each. We have one on the ark and one on the flood. So if you want to 
little booklet specifically about those things. That's a great resource for you. I know many of you are planning on visiting the ARC. We also have conferences down at the ARC in our 2500 seat auditorium, the Answer Center. We have one coming up this fall called One Race, One Blood, Biblical Answers for Racism. Wow, is that a hot topic, right? And a really good topic to get answers on. Uh, Keith and Kristen Getty, if you're familiar with them, they're modern hymn writers. I love them. They're amazing. They're going to be performing a concert um, at, the, at the conference, so you'll want to find out more information about that. We also have a women's conference there every year, which I direct, and I'm super excited about that next year, March 27th and 28th, um, Truth Uncovering the Lies We Believe, looking at a lot of things that have infiltrated the church and um, how we need to confront those and deal with those. I'm going to be out in the lobby for a little while, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop by. You've been a great audience, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day here. Thank you.